Thank you all for coming. This is a, a, a strange um, format, but I think uh, I explained some of it last night to some of you. I hope it's going to work out today. It's basically we're trying to create a conversation here um, to discuss this, this extraordinarily important topic. Um, we are, as you can see, filming this. This is a Science Network production. The Science Network has its headquarters here at, at the Salk Institute. And if you look inside the program on the inside front cover, you'll see um, a little bit, very brief description about what we'll do. The idea is to, to build a multimedia programming platform that will be a trusted destination for those concerned with science and its impact on society. Um, we're also doing this in conjunction with the Quick Jacob Center here at the Salk. And there's a couple of people I'd like to recognize in the audience who, uh, if they're st uh, here, uh, one is, oh yes, they're sitting at the back there, extraordinarily. Um, one is Rita Bronofsky. Um, Rita, good morning. How are you? I suppose if there's any reason, one reason that I could lay to actually standing here doing this this morning, it's, it's watching The Ascent of Man uh, in England growing up as a kid and just thinking what an extraordinary production that uh, Jacob Bronofsky did um, and thinking, I wonder if... One could make a living doing that sort of thing. <laughs> Looks really impressive. Uh, so I was, I was completely taken by what Bruno did there and um, got to know the family. And this is a sort of a full circle for me to be back. Back here at the Salk Institute where, of course, Bruno came and was a deputy director and instigated some programs which were very much about the communication of science, uh, the two cultures, and uh, the intersection of science and society issues. So uh, th this is, to me, the, the place to be doing this kind of a program. And it's, a, it's a sort of a tribute to Jacob Bronofsky and to Rita that, uh, that we're doing this. And also, of course, to Francis Crick, one of the first people I met in coming here in 1976 to talk to people about Bronofsky, in fact, was Francis. Um, sadly, no longer with us. But again, you'll see the, uh, see the description uh, inside the front cover about the Crick Jacob Center. And we're extremely happy that, uh, that Odile Crick is here this morning as well. We, um, we're going to do, let me just explain the format. We're, we're covering three basic themes. The first one is the clash of cultures, religion and science. Is this, in fact, a zero-sum game, or is there some compatibilist position that we can find? The second broad theory, the broad thread, is can we be good without God? So how do you get morality? Is there some evolutionary explanation, or do we actually have to have a re religious explanation? And the third strand is, if not God, then what? What do we do uh, in terms of these, um, what people have called spirituality? What do we do about meaning? How do we talk about purpose? Um, what do you do, in fact, as we say in the program here, um, can, we, can science help us create a new rational narrative as poetic and powerful as those that have traditionally sustained societies? Those are the three basic topics that we'll be dealing with. Um, there is, um, we will be dealing with topic one to begin with, um, which is the clash of cultures, and Stephen Weinberg will lead off on that. Uh, and then after the break, we'll go on to the third one, the if not God, then what, which is actually a natural segue. We'll hopscotch over the morality issue and do that this afternoon when Richard Dawkins arrives, which will be about 11 o'clock. Um, just one thought. Um, there was a, a, a terrorist plot, an extremist religious plot, uncovered um, on November the 4th, last night, in fact, in London. Um, the perpetrators had put a huge amount of gunpowder under the Houses of Commons. <laughs> And uh, there was a, the leader was, uh, in fact, they managed to get in there. I don't know if you know this story, but they managed to get in there because there was the space under the Houses of Commons was for rent. And you could just go and rent space under there. So these people cheerfully wheeled in great crates of gunpowder and so on and so forth. Somebody, somebody was a weasel and let the story out. And the, the person who was the ringleader, a man called Guy Fawkes, was apprehended. Um, this is uh, in England when I was growing up. Today, November the 5th, is gunpowder. Uh, is Guy Fawkes Day, gunpowder plot, when this group of um, Catholic extremists tried to blow up the Houses of Commons. So this, this kind of um, 
clash of cultures, if you like, um, clash of religions has been going on for a long time. Um, I'm not sure that we're going to be able to solve it uh, all in these two and a half days, but I certainly hope that in the Enlightenment tradition we'll be able to throw some more light on it. Uh, with that, um, I would. Uh, the other thing I'd like to say is that I'm not going to spend a lot of time with honorifics and descriptions of who people are. Um, you can get most of this from the program, um, which explains the, the whole story. Uh, Stephen Weinberg, uh, very briefly, though, is professor of physics and astronomy at the University of Texas, Austin. And I, for me, what is most important is the extraordinary things that he's written. Uh, I think his books are just a, a, a wonderful example of the combination of the two cultures. Um, they're elegant, uh, they're taught, they're incise, and I, um, I welcome him to this podium. Well, as uh, shown by the fact that we're here on a beautiful day uh, inside, Talking about these things, um, the tension between science and religion, this old problem, is still with us. In the United States, it has uh, surfaced uh, to the greatest extent in arguments over the theory of evolution. According to one poll taken by the Pew Foundation, 62% of Americans don't believe humans evolve from earlier life forms. Uh, this has been a big political issue in Kansas and Ohio and other places. Um, perhaps because of the way this uh, issue has a appeared politically in the United States, uh, many people talk about the conflict between science and religion as simply a matter of uh, misguided biblical literalism. Uh, and that the conflict can be resolved, many people think the conflict can be resolved simply by recognizing different scopes for science and religion. Um, this was expressed by Galileo in a letter to Christina of Lorraine. Uh, he said, the intention of the Holy Ghost is to teach us how one goes to heaven, not how heaven goes. Uh, he was actually uh, quoting a cardinal of the church, uh, the Vatican librarian, Cardinal Baronius, in saying this. So this is an old opinion that um, as long as we recognize the separate uh, magisteriums of science and religion, no problem. Uh, Stephen Gould and Freeman Dyson, uh, both friends of mine, uh, have argued this. They, they put it simply, science deals with fact, religion deals with values, end of the story. And many religious people, uh, especially in, in the West, would agree, uh, uh, and especially in the main denominations, the mainline denominations. And the Templeton Foundation is ready with lots of cash for people who will support this point of view. I don't think it's so easy. I think that the tension between science and religion has deeper roots than an argument over biblical literalism. I think that religion and science will go on for some time having negative effects on each other. Uh, for one, it's clear biblical literalism is, is not the only problem because it's an ancient problem that has been met and solved many times in the past. Uh, there was a time in the history of the early church when some church fathers uh, read verses in the book of Genesis and other parts of the Bible as indicating that the earth was flat in and hence rejected uh, the existing Greek understanding that the earth is a sphere. Uh, but uh, this, this was resolved uh, because people really didn't care very much what the shape of the earth was. And by the high Middle Ages, it was generally accepted among educated Christians that the earth is a sphere, and in fact, Dante found the core of the spherical earth a very convenient place to stash sinners. Um, this... Uh, that was once a serious issue has in fact become a joke. Uh, a friend of mine, Adrian Malat, 
a physicist at the University of Kansas, has formed a flat earth society um, to demand the teaching of the flat earth theory as an alternative to the spherical earth theory in Kansas public schools so that children will have the opportunity to make up their own mind about this scientific issue, uh, obviously in mockery of the uh, intelligent design movement. I think there are at least four other reasons for the conflict between science and religion. And I should say, in talking about religion, I am not talking about observance, morality, or rhapsodic spirituality. I'm not talking about the part of religion that has no cognitive content, what Susan Sontag called piety without content. Um, I'm talking about religion as a system of belief, because that's where the conflict arises. First of all, uh, science has historically downgraded human beings from a central role in creation. Nobody cares whether the Earth is a sphere, but they cared very much that it's not at the center of the universe. After all, this is the stage of a great cosmic drama of sin and salvation, and shouldn't it be center stage? Uh, of course, this led to the uh, problems that Galileo had in adopting the Copernican theory, and, and these problems lasted well into the 19th century uh, at Spanish universities like the University of Salamanca. Uh, theory of evolution, of course, is an obvious example. Uh, it treats human beings as another animal species that has developed through uh, a uh, m millennia of breedings and eatings uh, to be what it is, uh, not as part of the working out of a divine plan. As we learn more and more about the universe, science sees less and less sign of any special role for human beings, either in the laws of nature themselves or in the history of the universe, of the sort that's imagined by traditional religion. Uh, first, there was the discovery that the Earth is not at the center of the solar system. Then the solar system is not at the center of creation. It's just one of many in our galaxy. Our galaxy is not unique. That was discovered in the 1920, as late as the 1920s, that the universe has billions of galaxies extending in all directions. And in, just in recent years, uh, through developments in the theory of the very early universe, um, in particular the theory of cha chaotic inflation due to Andre Linde, uh, we now have a picture which is, in, I would say, plausible but not yet well established uh, that uh, our Big Bang, this enormous firmament of galaxies expanding in all directions, is just one episode in a much larger multiverse in which Big Bangs, or maybe I should say not so Big Bangs, are popping off all the time, world without end. And it may be that in this multiverse, uh, some of the things that we call the constants of nature vary from one part of the multiverse to another. Um, there were discoveries in string theory recently that lend a good deal of plausibility to that, but although I, I must say uh, I wouldn't defend this as something that is well-established science. Well, that's the first thing, that science downgrades humans for a central role. The second is that science makes religious, religious explanations unnecessary. 